This is a production of Cornell University. First, thank you all for coming. It's really nice to see such a, such a big group here. So I'm really excited to share some work that I started last year. This is all very new, and this is, these are really the initial results. There haven't been that many studies done, really at all, on, on the robot. A lot of uh, home testing, but nothing in a larger replicated uh, experiment. So today we'll talk a lot about turtle, but first I wonder how many of you have robots? Raise your hand and keep your hand raised. Does anybody have a weeding robot? Okay, I have four. I have four over here I just adopted last year. Okay, keep your hands raised. Does anybody have a drone? Okay, and if Jen Thomas Murphy was here, she, she has one. She recorded some of the footage. All right, what about a uh, dishwasher? Okay, it's not mobile, but a lot of us have dishwashers and laundry uh, or, and washing machines. So there you go. Everybody has a robot in some sort of fashion, and that's, that's the trend, increasing dependence on automation. So first, I want to start with why go away from uh, what, what's already been really useful? Herbicides have been relied on for decades now. They're cheap and they're still the go-to option for, for many growers, especially at large scales. But there are problems with herbicides. You'll see a figure here of the number of cases of herbicide resistance on the rise, increasing. These are unique cases of herbicide resistance. But there are other issues with herbicides too, uh, off off-target impacts, so you have health and environmental concerns, and there are no new herbicide technologies coming out. There hasn't, hasn't been a new mode of action since the 1980s. So we're kind of coming to the, the end of this, this huge uh, resource that is herbicides. So we really need to be thinking about what's next, what's the next step. And it's not necessarily organic ag. So you might think, okay, well, if we rip up the soil, that's a good way to kill weeds and not use herbicides. But there are many problems with disturbing the soil in this way. And big, bigger and bigger tractors have been the trend. And the, the consequences here are soil loss and soil uh, degradation. So organic's not necessarily the way to go. Herbicides aren't really the way to go. What, what are the options? Are there any other tools that can be sustainable? So bigger and bigger tractors have, have been the trend, and yet there, there are issues in this, uh, in this trajectory. One example is the impact on soil compaction. So I'll just show a little bit of uh, introductory data here. The number of passes uh, increases here, as does cone index, or com soil compaction. And there's a big difference here, too, with conventional tillage versus direct seeding or no-till. So with conventional tillage, there's just increasing capacity for the soil to be compacted. So I strongly believe we're at this, the precipice of a big paradigm shift in agriculture as a whole, given digital technologies, and specifically in weed control because of issues with herbicides and uh, organic, or um, a lot of the, the reliance in organic on disturbing the soil. That's not to say that all organic practices require that. There are many cultural practices that are also trying to get away from the repeated disturbance of the soil. So we could go backwards. We could go back to hand weeding. And in some cases, I think that is going to be necessary. The escapes, uh, weed escapes after an herbicide application might need to be controlled by hand weeding. If you let one Palmer amaranth plant, for example, go to seed that is you know, escaped an herbicide application, that's basically setting the, the stage for many, many years of Palmer amaranth seeds in the soil. So even one plant going to seed can, be, can cause many issues down the line. So hand weeding in that case might really be uh, a good, a good, a good uh, path. However, I don't think we should fully go back. There are some new technologies and I put mowing up here, not because it's a new technology, but maybe we can use it as a cultural practice. Why not mow in between our annual crops? Annual crops. 
what if we leave a small living layer of grasses in between our annual crops? Maybe that could be possible with technologies such as robots. Foaming, has anybody heard of this? This maybe isn't super new either, but foaming uses the heat and the insulative power of the bubbles and the foam to kill weeds. So foaming might actually be something that's increasing in, in use in, for weed control. Electrocution, you know, you could zap the weeds. There's a lot of research right now and farmers are actually using this. There's one, at least in New York State, a grower that's using electrocution to kill weeds on his farm. And microwaving. This is something I really know very little about, but there are other technologies out there that are probably going to be elevated in res as a result of decreasing effectiveness of herbicides as a main option. Some of these still require large tractors and energy, a lot of energy needs to go into using any form of tractor that I, that I know of. I don't think there are solar powered uh, tractors out there yet, but we'll get to the solar powered aspect of the, the turtle in just a minute. Drones, drones for spraying, microdoses of herbicides, that can really cut down on the volume of herbicides applied, but carrying enough herbicide to apply to a whole field, there are downsides there too in terms of energy. And scouting. I think drones could be a really good tool for scouting. Where are the weeds in the field? If weeds aren't distributed evenly across a field, they're often very patchy. And sometimes you're looking for maybe just that one escape. So I think drones could be a really important tool here. But then we get to robots. Okay, here's one example of a robotic weeder. It's pretty big. It's still on that, that trend of bigger is better maybe, but it has very big solar panels. This is a solar powered robotic weeder. It applies micro doses of an herbicide uh, made by Eco Robotics Company. And this is a little bit old, but I, I think uh, this industry is likely to be worth even more than 400 million. I think uh, this is really on the uptick as far as technologies that are being uh, welcomed in large-scale agriculture. All right, so that's just a little bit about how the eco-robotics one works, but along with the change in the, uh, in the welcoming of tiny houses, it's not just in the tiny house movement, it's also in ag, and one example is a small robot company out of the UK. They have uh, a few different robots that are small, and they're supposed to be small not to use just one in a field, but they're scalable. How big is your field? You can basically use as many robots as, as, as are necessary. And a couple other examples uh, from NIO, a French company. They have three different robots right now. One uh, for different veg for a vegetable scenario, and then larger scale models for, for other uh, industries. Just quickly showing some examples here. And also FarmWise, a San Francisco-based company that's using the imaging technology to know exactly where your crop plant is, is located and to track that, that crop plant through the growing season to be able to kill all of the other plants that are not designated as the desirable plant. Okay. So maybe bigger isn't better necessarily. Maybe we just need more smaller units. Not necessarily turtle, but I'm going to show you some data that uh, I think will support the idea that maybe a small robot is the way to go, and we don't necessarily need to go bigger, bigger, bigger. And what I think uh, Joe will mention too, that this is solar powered. It's just a really neat uh, way, I think, to capture the sun's energy to weed our gardens. And that's where I will hand it off to Joe. And he's going to talk a little bit about the genesis of turtle. So um, hopefully you're wondering where, 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 where turtle came from. It, 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 it really had a divine origin, I can, I can tell you that. Uh, no, actually, it, it came from a, um, uh, it, it started after a company that I had uh, founded before. I used to work at this company called Harvest Automation. And what harvest automation robots do is they, they solve the spacing problem on nursery and greenhouse farms. 
So uh, you bring the, the pots with the plants in them to the field, you set them down, and then rather than have an army of workers, like uh, if you notice the guy in the background, he's doing the spacing the old fashioned way, he's walking back and forth. Uh, instead, you have uh, robots to do this. So um, <clears throat> as a result of working at Harvest Automation, I got interested uh, once again in, in agriculture. And I was looking, and, and the reason that I was interested in agriculture, because it seems like there's so many opportunities for robots in agriculture, and I'm always looking for ways to, to bring more robots into the world. Um, and while I was, uh, uh, was thinking about this, I was trying to figure out, um, you know, what, uh, what, what would, how would robots benefit? And uh, a way that a lot of people have thought of is you have robots that go out and weed farm fields. Um, so uh, I thought about doing this while uh, I was at Harvest. I thought about trying to make another way, another robot that would, that would uh, I thought of some way that robots could be effective at this, cost effective. And I couldn't come up with any ideas that were better than what I saw lots of other people already doing. So I kind of put that aside for a while until I went to this conference in, uh, in Boston called Robo Madness. And uh, it's one of my favorite conferences. And uh, there I, I encountered a, an acquaintance of mine who suggested the idea of how about robots that weed home gardens. And that actually changes the problem just enough that uh, whereas I couldn't figure out a, a cost effective way to make a robot that weed uh, a farm field, I could come up with a way, a cost effective way of making a robot that weeds a home garden. So um, <clears throat> I left uh, Harvest Automation in June of 2015 and started uh, and sucked in some other folks to work on this with me. And we started uh, building iterations of a little robot that would uh, weed uh, uh, a home garden. And we started with, with Lego, which is where lots of robots start. Um, <clears throat> and it went through a bunch of iterations. Actually, we've spent about a year, um, about a year doing this. And we finally got to a, uh, a form that we thought this will actually work. We can be cost effective. It'll, uh, it'll do the thing that it's supposed to do. Um, so it's time to, uh, to take the next step. And the next step was to uh, do a Kickstarter campaign. So the Kickstarter campaign was, uh, was, was really uh, surprisingly effective. We, uh, um, we ended up being in the, uh, in, in terms of money collected for a project, we ended up being in the top one third of 1% of all Kickstarter projects. So we got a whole bunch of folks who signed up on Kickstarter and we kept uh, doing some pre-sales after the Kickstarter and we got to about half a million dollars in, uh, uh, in pledges from that. And then we had to, to ship the robots. So I want you to note, I go from here we are, this, this great promise, <clears throat> um, and then we have to ship the robots to, and then we ship the robots. It takes like a second for me to get from one slide to the next. It took over a year to get from the previous slide to this slide. So get into the place where you can actually build these things, put them in a box and give them to, to somebody who wants to, to buy one is, uh, it's, it's not, not trivial or, or quick. But anyway, this uh, it shows how the robot actually works. Um, it's supposed to speak. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, if it was speaking, what it would tell you that the robot runs around, it finds, uh, <clears throat> and it shows you uh, even better here, the robot runs around, it finds, um, uh, if it notices a weed, it senses the weed, and I'll get a robot. It senses the weed with a weed sensor on the bottom. Uh, there's a little weed whacker behind that. Uh, the, uh, the weed whacker turns on and chops the weed down. Uh, when it gets to a plant that you want, it detects the plant with a, a sensor on the front and it turns away from it. Um, <clears throat> and that basically is all that you need to do to, uh, to build a robot that, um, that will weed your garden, plus make it waterproof and not get stuck and, and all of the other things. <clears throat> so uh, it doesn't work absolutely everywhere. The, uh, the picture on the left is actually from one of our Turtle customers who sent this telling us that um, this is the first time in, uh, in 30 years that he had come back from a vacation and found that his garden was not actually choked with weeds because the, the turtle kept working while, while he was off uh, having fun. Um, but there's, the places where it, it, it would have some trouble is 
if you just finished rototilling your garden and it looks like this, uh, turtle won't work in this garden until you have, you have raked away the, the ruts and the ridges and then it'll work fine. But there are some places where it really doesn't work at all. And that is places where the, uh, the slopes are really steep or the, the plants are, are planted so densely that turtle can't go in between them. So <clears throat> something that we, um, we expected that, that's the robot again. Um, there's a weed whacker on the bottom of the robot. And when we were designing the, um, when we were designing the, re the, the robot, what we thought was, okay, uh, the weed whacker is gonna do all the work. It'll cruise along, the weeds have to grow up to a certain height before they can be detected by the weed sensor. But when that happens, it'll turn on the whacker and it'll cut the weed. So what we expected to see in our company garden was we expected to see a lot of little green stumps where the robot had cut the weeds down. But instead, what we saw was that we just didn't come up. And uh, our hypothesis was that, and still is, that basically what's happening, the fact that the wheels, uh, and perhaps with some help from the whacker, are churning just the, the surface of the soil a little bit. As soon as the weed germinates, it gets, uh, it gets brushed in such a way that it, it tends to kill the, the, the sprouting part. And that, that, that it may be that uh, much or most of the, uh, uh, the weed killing action is, is because of the wheels rather than, than the whacker. So uh, the way that the uh, Cornell connection happened at least from my point of view, is out of the blue, I got this uh, email from Christine where she said, give me a robot. Um, and, and the later she said, no, give me four robots. And, but it turned out it was, it, was, it was a good idea. It worked out really well. Uh, and I, was, I, I came down earlier, uh, back in, in last summer, and, uh, and, and the rigor with which she conducted these, <laughs> these experiments and how well the, the robot worked is just any, way beyond anything that that I could ever have done. So it, it's, uh, it's worked out really well and, and has gotten some good results that she'll, uh, she'll tell you about. Um, so just to go on a little bit about the potential for uh, this kind of technology, <clears throat> um, we have a lot of plans for the robots that we will build next. And since we discovered that we don't necessarily need the weed whacker, it's actually possible to build an even smaller robot that will work in more densely packed gardens uh, that just uses the wheels alone to kill the robots. Um, <clears throat> in this robot, we actually attached little exacto blades to where the whacker goes. Don't try this at home, but it actually does work. You can make a tiny little uh, lawnmower from the, the robot by, by doing something like this. We actually have ideas about how to make a totally finger safe uh, uh, lawn mowing uh, attachment, um, but we haven't, uh, haven't done that quite yet. So, so there's also a possibility of instead of uh, just bouncing around, which is what Turtle does now, if instead you followed the rows, um, you could basically get a lot more area. Uh, one turtle would be able to cover a lot more area than the current one does. It's just that you would have to plant your garden in rows rather than just sort of individual plants. We've also had ideas about building a, uh, uh, a robot that just sweeps all the debris off your deck and keeps it always clean. And we've had an idea about how to build um, a robot that eliminates the weeds that grow up in your patio between the, the pavers. <clears throat> uh, what we would like to get to at some point is, uh, so at first I didn't know how to build a robot for farm fields. But as a result of working on turtle, I think I do now. And so this is uh, one product that we would like to uh, to get to to someday. This, this is Photoshop. We don't actually have this product yet, but uh, that's what we want to get to. We want to get to a robot that can compete uh, with herbicides on a cost basis. So <clears throat> uh, we have a, uh, what I think is a really cool uh, consumer product here, but don't think that there is some deep pocketed giant corporation behind it. Uh, the, the folks who, uh, uh, who made this uh, robot and took it all the way through the Kickstarter and through the, the first shipment. So this is all of us. This is the entire company right here. So what we are doing now is uh, we're riding the tiger. So uh, our company is a startup. And what we have, we think, is a, is a really innovative product. 
we have a great team and we've got a really promising start. Um, and to fulfill that, that promise, what we are doing now is we are raising funds and we're talking to, to VCs and such like. Um, <clears throat> and we think that the product that we have here is comparable to, uh, to Roomba. We think that the market is about the same size or maybe bigger even than Roomba's market. And currently, uh, iRobot is a $1.5 billion company. So that's where we're aiming for. But it is a startup. And if investors don't invest or if gardeners don't buy robots, then the, uh, the tiger is going to get a hearty meal. That's my part. <laughs> Joe is right. I did email him pretty much out of the blue. And this was really because I was interested in incorporating more digital ag into the weeds course that I've been teaching. And so I was doing some research and, and it came up pretty quickly, the, the weeding robot. And I could imagine using this in my own garden. I have two Roombas actually, one upstairs, one downstairs. And so I have had an interest in, in robots for some time myself. And so the first robot I got was just one. I only got one the first time. And I did a really small trial up at Caldwell Field just to see, would this work on you know, a, a typical soil that we have on campus? And I set up the experiment just with the little guards that come included with, with the product. And I was really impressed. This is what we, what we saw after just a few weeks, early in the season last, last spring. So I, I asked uh, Joe if he would send me three more, and, and he did. And I thought that was kind of the minimum that we would need four to run an experiment. So with a lot of help from Farm Services and Matt Ryan, and I'll list all, everybody who helped, uh, we came up with this, in, this experiment. And not just a small little one plot, but we use area in the crop garden and in field L up at Caldwell Field also. And to begin, in this one field, we were going from sod or an old hay field, pretty much. So this is an established community. And so we expected a lot of weed pressure. We expected a lot in the seed bank. But we also wanted to overseed, just to make sure there, there were going to be enough seeds to really evaluate the effectiveness. So this is our intern last summer from Columbia. Uh, Maria Paula is overseeding with an earthway seeder. Uh, four different species. We're using cover crop species, but we're kind of expecting them to act like our weeds. These are our mimic, mimicked weeds. And the next thing we needed was a set of barriers. So you could see some of them scattered on the left here. And this came from a pile that I found up at Caldwell Field. And the, the true use of these are vertical supports for pallet shelving. So just a pile that wasn't being used. Uh, unfortunately, they're very heavy. So that was the biggest downside. We ended up using uh, two by fours later on, which is what I would recommend if this were to be redone. Um, Scott and our interns really had to use some, some muscles to move these around. But we set up uh, two different locations. One on the left here is in the crop garden and the other in field L at Caldwell Field. So this is our new field, if you will, and this is our old field. And what else do I want to say? So the plots were six by eight feet or 1.8 by 2.4 meters big. And let's see, this is after setting it up. It was a hard day. So this is Julie just saying, oh, I'm so glad this is over with. But uh, we set up a randomized complete block design. And let's see, uh, in each of the fields. So these are our four treatments, turtle with the trimmer, turtle without the trimmer, and then two controls, a weedy control and then a hand weeded control, hand weeded by me. And uh, I did record that, but I won't show you that. <laughs> so in three consecutive weeks, we evaluated how well turtle works. So this was at the end of July through three weeks in, in August last summer. And uh, there it is. So we alternated the robots uh, from blocks one and three in um, mornings and blocks two and four in the afternoon. So those were set. And we used the charging capacity so that we had enough energy to get through the whole hour. 
We also had to have software adjustments made on the production uh, software just so that it would run for that long. It's set to turn off at 70% charge. We had it altered so that it would make it through a 50% charge. And we randomized the turtle units across the trimmer and no trimmer treatment. So I was just switching the trimmer between robots. And I had to replace the trimmers as well uh, partway through. If you want, you could come look at them afterwards. They just get worn down a little bit. So that's one thing that will, will need to be replaced. I had my kids out there helping a little bit. They really like the robots a lot, but they also like hoeing. So they do, they do some of both. All right, so the hand weeding, for, for me, it took three to five minutes or so per, to hand weed per plot. And I just thought that was kind of interesting data to collect. And you, we could go you know, a little bit more in the calculations, back of the envelope calculations, to how much weeding effort would it take for you know, a human to hand weed versus the robot. And so it was pretty different. The robot's spending two hours per week in these plots. Which is, which is quite a bit. This is only 48 square feet. And yet Joe was just telling me that now one robot can actually cover and maintain 200 square feet of garden space. So this is kind of a lot of uh, robotic weeding effort in these small plots. But we kind of wanted to see what, what it could do at its best. All right, so this is some drone footage that Jen Thomas Murphy collected. Uh, in the center here, this is actually the weedy control. So this is in the middle of the experiment, and actually maybe more towards the beginning of the experiment. There aren't that many weeds in this particular field. It's a, it's a pretty hard soil, so it's difficult for small seeded weeds to emerge. And here, this is a, the trimmer treatment, and the other one that you saw on the right was the no trimmer treatment. So this is just a little bit of footage to, to whet your appetite for the results. And this also shows you how well the area is covered. So we noticed that there's a little bit of an edge effect. The robot seems to spend more time around the edge. So when we collected data, we only collected the data from the center of these plots. And Joe mentioned that's something that can be changed as far as the software. You could change how the robot moves. And if it senses a, a barrier, you know, maybe it can spend more time away from that barrier. Anyways, there was pretty good coverage throughout the plot. And again, we had it set to run for a whole hour. So there's a one hour weeding session. All right, so just one other example of the edge or barrier effect. Sometimes it would get stuck. And you could see it just spinning its wheels sometimes. Uh, if it went for more than a few seconds, I would move it. And I also have the, the record of how long it spent spinning, just because I downloaded the log files afterwards. So that's a whole nother data set that I haven't really explored too much. But if I noticed it didn't have the full hour runtime, I would put it back in for, to make sure it had a full hour of runtime. This is towards the end of the experiment. You could see the weedy control here in the, in the bottom left. And this is really close to the end of the experiment. Uh, I'm going a little bit quickly so that we have time for some questions. But on the left, this is the, what the weedy control looked like three weeks after we started. So this is basically three weeks and one day after the rototilling. And uh, there was also rolling. So I didn't mention that. Rototilling and rolling were part of the seedbed preparation. And on the right, this is the hand weeded control. So these are the two extremes. What happens if we don't do any weeding? And what happens if we do pretty intensive, right? I thought it was uh, sweat inducing labor. All right, so then what do the turtle treatments look like? Drum roll, please. This is the turtle with trimmer on the left. Looks almost as good, maybe better even, than the hand weeded control in some plots. And without the trimmer, there's still some plants there and you'll see in the in the other results too the turtle without the trimmer did not perform as well as that with the trimmer considering the production wheels and that these are not the production wheels i'll get to that in a minute all right so the turtle effect on weed cover this is just total weed cover or plant abundance and we'll focus on the blue bars first so the higher the percentage cover the the worse the weeding effort really was. So you'd have more of a yield loss, the bigger the bar is. So with the weedy control, you know, you're gonna have a lot of weed competition with your crops. 
And yet, if you compare it to the turtle in this case, in this field with their blue bars, there's still an effect, even without the trimmer, you're seeing a reduction from about 50% weed cover down to 30% weed cover. So in this particular location in the crop garden, there was a big effect even with just the, the turtle without the trimmer. But if you look at the hand weeded control versus the turtle with the trimmer, this is really an astounding result. You're getting as good weed control with the, with the robot, including the trimmer, as, you, as my hand weeding effort. So those are not statistically different, which really is uh, a pretty, pretty good result for the turtle. And oh, I showed just a little, I'm showing just a little bit of statistics. If you're interested in the stats, I have all of the code I'm willing to share. I did my stats in R. I used a Elmer model. I did use a square root transformation for this data and uh, E means for post hoc means comparison. All right, so now I have letters up here for the other field as well. No difference in this second field, field L, between uh, the weedy control and the T minus, but there's definitely impro an improvement um, in weeding capacity with the, with the trimmer. Okay, 47 species were recorded. I won't go into much more of the actual species than this. Uh, four of the species were the ones that we had overseeded, but 43 were present in the seed bank or in the propagule bank. Many rhizomes, I think, were emerging in, in our crop garden location. All right, so I won't spend too much time on this. Uh, I did find an effect of the treatment on weed diversity, though I didn't see a difference at, when the post hoc means analysis. Uh, it does look like diversity measured by the Shannon diversity index uh, based on the cover data is reduced in, in the turtle plus the trimmer treatment. All right, and what if we look at the monocots versus the dicots? I, I would expect a difference considering the trimmer only works up to one inch. Uh, so it's not trimming much below that one inch. It's at a little bit of an angle, but we would expect plants that have a growing point below that, i.e. grasses that have a growing point below the soil surface or monocots or sedges included here too, are, are going to be selected for based on this, uh, this robot, as well as any dicots or broadleaf plants that have really low growing habits, such as this purslane, common purslane. Maybe it could escape or be selected for uh, based on this, this weeding approach. So just to compare uh, effect of dicots versus monocots, um, you'll see here first, if you're just looking at dicots, you're getting an effect just with the, the wheels. The wheels are, are doing a fairly good job at reducing the abundance of your broadleaf weed species. And the same is not necessarily true for the monocots. So basically the, the conclusion here briefly is that turtle is more effective on broadleaf weeds than on grasses, which we, we kind of expected. And maybe it's not surprising either that mo most of the herbicide resistant weeds are grasses. So this, I think, is a really good time to start thinking about which weeds will be selected for and really anticipate which weeds could be resistant to uh, this kind of machine and to try to be thinking ahead and not run into the same issue that we've run into with herbicides. Uh, just a couple of the observations. Uh, we found that if even a little bit of moisture was there on the soil surface, this is after dew. It was a completely dry, clear day, but there was dew on the soil surface, and it really attaches to the wheels and gets stuck on. Joe has observed that this will fall off as the soil dries out in the morning hours, but we would run our trials at nine in the morning, so it wasn't that early in the morning. And also, some of them would develop this cone shape, and I have a, an example of what a cone-shaped wheel might look like. And so it's interesting that that's the shape the soil would uh, um, take on as it builds on the wheels. Okay, what did we do when it was raining? I, I was taking the advice of the, the developer to use it even if it's raining. So I did that on a couple of occasions and it really didn't go so well. So this is what happened. You could kind of see it's just stuck in the mud. Just like anything would get stuck in the mud if you're moving around, your foot could get stuck in the mud, you know? And Farmers aren't going to operate their 
their equipment, their tillage equipment, they shouldn't be if it's really wet. So there's been consideration to make a, a mud sensor of, of sorts so that it doesn't operate when it's really muddy. You could see the, the leftover footprint of that, um, that kind of event. So I didn't continue to do that throughout the trial. That happened once, and if it was raining, I would just delay the trial till it was dry enough. All right, so turtle effect on weed cover measured by my smartphone. So the other data were based on Scott and I looking at each species and estimating ocularly the percent cover. This data is based on putting out my, my smartphone, taking a picture of the plot using Canopio. So Canopio is just a really simple app to estimate the, the ground cover. And I apologize, these are not in the same order uh, on the x-axis, but basically the same result. Weedy control is not that much different than the turtle without the trimmer, but the hand weeded control is uh, pretty similar to what we were seeing with the T plus. And that was in August. I went back a month later. I was really curious just to see what happened a month later after we stopped, after we stopped the trials. No difference across uh, the treatments in the crop garden. I was astounded to see that there was still a difference. There was an effect of the turtle with the trimmer treatment a month later. And that was the only one that was significantly different from, from the other treatments. So there was a long-term effect, which I really didn't anticipate at all. And it would be interesting to, to look at that further. All right, I'm not the only one looking at turtle in kind of a, a, an experimental way. Uh, Eric Gallant and some of his students up at the University of Maine have done a little bit of work. I have the website here. But they were looking at mustard seeded in, uh, in a greenhouse. And they saw pretty good results. And they were looking at dry and moist conditions. So that kind of uh, is a signal that the robot will work differently depending on the soil conditions, the soil moisture and soil type, I think is gonna make a big difference. But even without the trimmer, they were seeing some, some promising results. So that led us to think more about the wheel design. These are two white wheels that were 3D printed by Joe. He sent them to us. And that really got me thinking, how could, how could we, design some new wheels. Well, it turns out the 3D printers on campus allow us to print new wheels. So I had my students design wheels this past semester in the fall, and these were their, their handwritten ideas, but they then designed the wheels uh, in Man Library in the makerspace and printed them. So I have the, these wheels up here that they printed the students designed in the class as a class project. And so Chris uh, Sitko and Josh Fontaine, I think they just left, uh, designed these, and he, he was my TA in the fall. So he designed this, this bench um, arena. And so we, we tested the wheels in the greenhouse, and you could see you, even the production wheels were getting a lot of soil stuck to them, but especially the wheels the students designed, I think because of the material. So the material of the wheel is really important. Some materials are gonna shed soil a lot better than, than others. Uh, we cleaned off this one star wheel just so you could see a little bit of what it looked like. But the students got creative. They had sometimes different wheels in the front versus the back. And that's, this is the robot uh, I have right here. The big wheels didn't fit in the, uh, in the front of the robot. So we have some production wheels on there. But I think it was a really good project. They got to use a 3D printer and really think through how can we disturb the soil just at the surface akin to skim plowing to have the same effect as what Joe had been observing and, and also at University of Maine. Just the wheels are doing some of the weeding here. So we had a fun time doing that and I plan to do it again in my class. So we did end up using the, the robots in, in my course and in addition, we got some, some neat data. So with that, we just kinda go over the highlights here. Uh, the turtle with the trimmer achieved weeding as good as hand weeding. So that's really a great result. I think that's more than what Joe would be hoping for. And without the trimmer, reduced weed cover in one field, but not the other. So there's definitely an effect of soil and plant community. Uh, we're looking at turtle being more effective on broadleaf species or dicots versus monocots. And that's something that just needs to be taken into account. Um, 
still a very new area of robotics. And I don't know, Joe, if you want to come up here too. Uh, redesigning the wheels offers some potential for increasing the efficacy. And I'll let Joe uh, talk, speak a little bit to you about, uh, speak a little bit about this last point. Uh, the cost competitive. Uh... Yes. Yeah, that's, and then we'll take questions because like, we're hoping there are still a couple minutes for that. Uh, yeah, it's it, it. Robots are really hard. It's really hard to build one that uh, that one does what it's supposed to do and does it uh, at a cost that uh, people can afford. And that's that 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 last point is is the big dream that we're uh, that we are trying to get to. Uh, it's not going to happen this year uh, or or next year, but if we can. Uh, if we can make a success of the company, we, we're definitely going to keep on uh, working on uh, on this track. So. So thank you. Thank you. Why don't we open it up to questions? Um, if you wanted to get some money, we can send it over to Joe. And <laughs> Go ahead. So, yeah. So, so a couple of points there on the on the issue of the hose. Um, the what we intend to do is to make the turtle able to climb uh, typical irrigation hoses of like you know half an inch or something. Um, some of our customers had trouble with that uh, initially, and what we advised them to do is to dig a little trench so that the hose could be down in it. Um, the the robot is pretty good about. Um, uh, it's pretty good at mobility. Basically, we spent a year, uh, the first year, trying to improve its mobility and, 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 and make it work well. Um, you can build a structure in, uh, in your garden that the turtle can't get over. It can climb any um, a slope of about 20 degrees. Beyond that, it turns away because it doesn't want to tumble, tumble over. Um, so we do recommend that uh, it sort of be rake smooth. You rake the garden and it's smooth enough uh, the turtle could work place like that. Oh, they are in the market. Yes. You can buy one today. Uh, they're $350. How, like, how big do one of these plants need to be before I can put that thing in my oven? So the, uh, basically the way it works is um, <clears throat> there's a uh, turtle discriminates between uh, uh, crops and weeds based on height. So if the if it's taller than about, uh, if, if rather, if you're, if the plant is shorter than about this, uh, it thinks that it's uh, a weed and it'll cut it down. If it's about three inches or so tall, two or three inches tall, it thinks that it's a crop and it'll turn away from it. So it would work really well with transplants. If you have a transplanted garden, that kind of protects your your crop plants. Yeah. You also mitigate that by putting a flag or something. Right? So what the robot comes with are these things that we call plant guides and they look like tiny little tomato cages. So if you have a seedling, you put the, the plant guide around it and then when the uh, uh, and turtle will leave it alone, when it grows up as tall as the, the, the barrier on the, uh, the, the plant guide, then you can take it away if you want to and it'll, it'll uh, also be good. Uh, question is, uh, do you use any images or arithmetic? It's just based on height. Yeah. Right. If your crop is less than one inch tall, it'll cut it down. I mean, basically, it, it is random, and there it, it's random is bad in that you don't know exactly where it's going to go at any one time. But it's good in the same way that you know, uh, <clears throat> if you put um, uh, a gas into a bottle, eventually the gas will occupy all parts of the bottle, right? Even if it starts at one end. And if you let the turtle run long enough in a garden, eventually it will cover all parts of the garden equally. At least that's the aim. So you, you can't really make a, since it doesn't know where it is, it can't create, a, uh, it can't follow a pattern. Uh, it, it only can follow a pattern based on dead reckoning, right? It, it moves forward and it figures out where it's been by integrating uh, its motions. But that there's so much, uh, as they say, that uh, the error grows without bound. So it doesn't know where it is after it has wandered around a, a while. We've actually had uh, some discussions with folks uh, running landscape companies who, as a part of their service, weed home gardens. 
and apparently their 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 people don't like the weeding of the garden, so they're uh, they're considering just installing a, a robot in their in their client site. Yeah, we we are in discussions with uh, with such folks. Wheels, especially important. What are the current production wheels made out, and what are the options? So these, uh, the the wheels on the uh, current robot are made out of ABS plastic, which is a uh, simple, uh, you know, it's, it's cheap plastic. Uh, they also have uh, a UV inhibitor in it. Otherwise, it has to stand. It has to live in the outdoors, exposed to the sun. So it needs the UV inhibitor to, to not disintegrate over time. Uh, but there are other options that we would really like to explore, like uh, Teflon or Delrin or maybe even metal for the weed uh, for the wheels would uh, would be a better material for not uh, accumulating mud. And that just reminded me, Joe has told me that the product will probably last three to five years. So that's pretty pretty neat. It's not going to be just a one year thing. Well, the first thing that we have to do is uh, make the robots work at, at a, an affordable price. Um, if we can uh, impact the, uh, the e-waste issue by making them live longer, that, that's a good thing. Uh, I know that uh, there's a lot of interest in, in, in that sort of thing at our company. We haven't been able to, to do a lot of uh, real steps yet, but uh, we'll work on that. Thank you all for coming. And if you want to check out the, the robots, feel free to come up and check them out. So thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.